Hi there and welcome. Uh, I'm Bob Schrum. Uh, I run the Center for the Political Future at USC. I used to uh, be a strategist in political campaigns where actually I made some acquaintance with Karl Rove. Uh, let me introduce uh, this panel starting at the other end. Jim Fallows, longtime writer for The Atlantic. He and his wife Deborah just traveled across America over a period of years and produced a remarkable book called Our, Our Towns, a thousand mile, mile journey into the heart of America. Uh, Senator Jeff Flake, principal conservative, author of The Conscience of a Conservative, who didn't run for re-election in 2018 amid the Trumpian storm in the GOP. Carl Rove, chief strategist for George W. Bush in 2000 and 2004, served in the White House, writes a column for the Wall Street Journal, and has written a fascinating book about the 1996 presidential campaign between William McKinley and William Jennings Bryan. Re what? 1896. Did I say 1996? I, I got up at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, Brett Stevens, columnist for the New York Times, uh, in addition to his book entitled America in Retreat, The New Isolationism and the Coming Global Disorder, which now seems quite prophetic, uh, he gave a speech in 2017, a remarkable speech, on the dying art of disagreement. So it fits perfectly with our topic. Let me ask very directly, and we'll start with Brett, uh, how polarized are we, and are we making the situation worse <laughs> by thinking we're experiencing the most dire polarization since the Civil War? Well, I think the answer to the second question is yes, I do think we make matters worse, and that a, a lack of historical perspective doesn't... Um, doesn't help us. I mean, are we polarized compared to, to when exactly? Uh, to 1968 and the battles over the Vietnam War? Are we as polarized as we were um, during the Grant administration when we were suppressing the Ku Klux Klan? Uh, never mind uh, the battles over Kansas in the, uh, in the 1850s. So compared to those episodes in American history, I would say the answer is, well, not particularly. We are we are a, a country that is going through, um, let's put it this way, a, a difficult phase in its marriage. Um, <laughs> and uh, that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned or shouldn't take steps to do something about this. Uh, but I don't think we need to start using metaphors uh, with respect to war. I will say that there is one thing that greatly worries me, which is that the advent of uh, social media, which really should be called anti-social media, mm -hmm. um, has, has, has succeeded in recreating a form of politics or forms of politics that we thought we had put behind us in the middle of the 20th century. In particular, the ability to create what in effect is a mob on social media that targets uh, individual voices, individual writers, in, in, individuals in a way that is genuinely um, uh, frightening in its uh, intensity, in its irrationality, uh, and uh, above all, in its, uh, uh, in its consequences. And I think this is having an effect, among other things, on literary life. If you do nothing else today, look up an extraordinary speech by George Packer. It is his piece for receiving the, uh, the, the, uh, the Hitchens Prize. And he talks about the effect of being a writer in your 30s and 40s today when the risk of saying anything remotely consequential or controversial um, can be, can be career-ending. Uh, and that, I think, is something that really, really ought to worry us, which is the ability of people on the very fringes of political discourse to have not just a voice, but a veto in the way that we express ourselves as Americans. Uh, Carl, uh, your former boss, George W. Bush, uh, listened to uh, the inaugural address of Donald J. Trump, and as they were coming off the platform, famously said something to Barack Obama like, what kind of blank was that? Uh, is Trump a kind of uniquely divisive figure among presidents who drives this polarization? Well, first of all, it was purportedly said to Hillary Clinton, not Barack Obama, and <laughs> I'm going to neither affirm nor deny the uh, statement that attributed the former president. But, but look, no, he's not uniquely um, divisive uh, as far as presidential candidates. He may be unusual. We've had a few very divisive presidents. Uh, one of them, uh, 
is his model, Andrew Jackson, who uh, you, you heard last night um, the famous quote about, if, if I should have taken the chance I had to kill Clay and hang Calhoun. Uh, but th this was routine. I'm, I'm doing some work in Jackson on the nullification crisis. And my God, he's angry not only in his private letters, but his public pronouncements. But I, I, I think this is, each one of these moments, I, I'm with Brett, we're not at war. We, we were at war once, and 600,000 Americans died as a result. So let's not, let's not get carried away. Uh, there's gonna be a, a, a program immediately following this that examines this in more detail. So I won't go into my brilliant talk <laughs> now. But, <laughs> but, but this one, each one of these moments seems to be different. And I think, I think Brett is right, social media has a big impact uh, in this. And if you look at other moments, like the, the 18, late 1840s and the 1850s, we also had technological change. We had instantaneous movement of information across the nation through the telegraph. I mean, remember, it used to take weeks to get information from New Orleans to Boston, and now suddenly, in the, following, the years following 1844, information began to move rapidly. We had, in the Gilded Age, a similar technological impact, cheap daily newspapers. At one point, we had 19 daily newspapers in New York City because the cost of them dropped dramatically as people figured out how to print them cheaper. Uh, we had the 1920s and the 1930s with the growth of populism in that moment using a new technology, radio. We had Father Coughlin using radio to stir up anti-immigrant um, sentiment around, around the country. And then we've had the growth of the networks, which TV networks, which tended to bring us together temporarily, but social media is pulling us apart. And, but no, I, I, look, the, 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 we will survive this president's just as we've survived previous presidents who've had moments, but it's gonna take a concerted effort to deal with social media and the, and, the, and the things that have given rise to the disruption and the division. There's a reality behind people's feelings about why they're as angry as they are on both the left and the right. We are going through a populist moment and people on both sides of this believe that they have real reasons to feel the way that they do. And until we can figure out how to to have the leadership that will help bridge those divides, we're going to be where we are. Jeff, you've been in the cockpit of that polarization in the United States Senate and decided not to run again in 2018, I think in part because of it. How bad is it? It's pretty bad right now. Um, I, I, you know, you always think it's worse than when you sit down with historians and you listen, uh, you, you, you get some, um, you know, affirmation that we can get through this. Um, <laughs> I'll repeat it. Phone up here just said, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. <laughs> Say that again. It was so good. <laughs> yeah. But if you read John Meacham, you know, the soul of America, and talking about, uh, you know, how we've been through worse and we got through it. But that was before nuclear weapons and Twitter. <laughs> and, you know, you wonder if uh, this is a different era, and it, it, it certainly brings it more to the fore. As an elected official, and we spoke a little about this in the last forum, I can tell you the incentives right now uh, to get together and to work together across the aisle, for example, um, or to actually deliberate, which the Senate has been known for, there are just very few incentives. Every incentive is to rush to your tribe and state where you are and stay there because that's where the political safety is. And, and I suppose we'll be there for a while. We won't snap out of that that quickly. Social media certainly exacerbates it. But uh, but elected officials, and you see it this this week. You've seen it in the last several weeks. The incentives really push us to our tribes. And until those incentives change, and that may be a process, uh, then we're going to be in this. And it it uh, there have been worse times certainly. Uh, but it's pretty bad right now in terms of the incentives that elected officials face. Jim, you, that's, a, that's the perspective from someone who served in the Senate. We've heard the perspective from history. You, you and Deborah traveled around the country. Yeah. How divided is it out there? Is it different out there than it is in um, the Beltway? Yes, I think so. And I think, and Deb and I think, in a way different from the normal press narrative. It's interesting, there is an array of normal political alignments reflected in this panel, but I think it's strike. I agree very much with Brett Stevens and Karl Rove and Senator Flake that 
this is part of the continuum of American disruption. If you look at the history of any era, especially the 1840s or the 1880s or the 1890s, you have technological change, you have people in movement, you have political strife, all the things we have now. So one of the things that Deb and I saw was uh, evidence around the country of being in a second gilded age with many of the same tensions that Americans went through a century plus ago. So yes, there are the disruptions and divisions that come from that. Um, second, I think all of us have been involved in national politics in one way or another. I worked for Jimmy Carter long ago as a speechwriter, and we, I think that national politics are probably more tribalized, more polarized than they've been in a long time. The very first national magazine article I did back in 1974 was for Esquire about a man named Charles Wiggins, who was a very conservative Republican congressman from El Monte who was on the Judiciary Committee for the Nixon impeachment hearings. And I spent a year with him. And about it, Charles Wiggins you know, was initially very strongly for, uh, for Nixon, but he came around with the force of the evidence. It's hard to find his counterparts right now, the counterparts of Mr. Wiggins. The article was called The Ordeal of Mr. Wiggins. But the, the other thing that Deb and I have found that we talk about in our book is at the level of everything else except national politics in American life, you find a still functioning level of society. You find practicality and comity and reinvention. And I'll just, just mention may, maybe two examples. One is most of the places we went ended up voting for Donald Trump. They were conservative places. One of them was Dodge City, Kansas. Scene of gun smoke, now a majority Latino uh, place because of the, the meatpacking industry. It has a white power structure, a majority Latino population. When the Kansas state government began cutting back school funding, the voters of Dodge City, majority white, passed a big school levy to fund their schools for a majority Latino school population. Something similar happened in Holland, Michigan, the, the home of, of Betsy DeVos. And we found things like that all over the place. The head of ROTC in the Sioux Falls, South Dakota public school is a girl who once walked out of Darfur and whose mother works in the, uh, the, one of the big pork uh, processing plants in, in, in Sioux Falls. We saw things like that around the country, here nearby in San Bernardino. I grew up in Redlands, right next to San Bernardino, just 30 miles down I-10. San Bernardino's public schools have become arguably the most innovative in the state. I think any of you want to go see what, what public schools can do to reinvent themselves with a 90% non-white population. Um, you go to San Bernardino. Just one final point on the press. All of us are involved in the media in one way or another. Um, I think there's been an overcorrection by the national press after the 2016 election. We know that was a hair's breadth election with enormous consequences, and if a thousand things went a different way, the outcome would have been different. I th one of the primal impulses of the press is fear of missing out on something. And I think there was a fear of having missed out on things out there. And so you had people go out to diners in Iowa and Kentucky and West Virginia and Alabama and say, how angry are you really? Our experience is if you ask people how angry they are, they'll say, oh, we're really angry. And if you ask them about national politics, it will be like turning on cable news and you won't hear anything interesting from that second on. But if you ask them what's happening to the schools, who's moving here, how's the town getting better or worse, I think you see more of this sort of fabric of renewal and practicality that people, America, China, where we live for a long time, looks less impressive the closer you get to it. America looks more impressive the closer up you view it. What about... Yeah. <laughs> Let me follow that up uh, with something else you've written about and discussed, the decline of local newspapers. What's the impact of that? That has a profound impact, as I'm sure you all know. And one of the most practical illustrations is that cities where there's not a local newspaper, their bond rating deteriorates. They have to pay much higher interest rates for bonds because people know that the city government is not being held accountable. And there's a sense of community and contact that just is lost with the decline of local papers. Something I've been very interested in, as you know, Bob, is looking at the new models for local journalism. A lot of it involves a shift away from a hedge fund or private equity ownership model, which for reasons I won't go into really makes it hard to sustain local journalism. Also, I'll tell you later about Report for America 
which is an organization that everybody here should look at and try to support. And there's, it's a time of experimentation. For well, you. tell us now. So, okay, I'll tell you now. <laughs> um, so Report for America, the business model is um, a shared investment. A small paper that's struggling has to put up $10,000 itself for a new reporter on a new beat. Let's say healthcare in reservations in Wyoming or you know, um, a climate change and its impact in South Carolina. It up, puts up $10,000. It has to raise $10,000 from local philanthropy, the idea to be to mobilize them, and then t a Report for America gives them $20,000. So for $40,000 a year, they get some reporter, usually in his or her mid to late 20s, somebody not right out of college like Teach for America, but somebody ex experienced, and they go there for, for two years to, to the paper. Three years ago when this started, they had 13 people. Last year, they had 61. This year, they have 250. They're aiming for 1,000. I think bang for your buck philanthropically is as strong here as any place. Here endeth my speech. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brett. What did you mean, and then I'd like everybody else to discuss it, by the dying art of disagreement? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, disagreement is an art. It can be done uh, well or, or very badly. It can be done in a manner intended to um, seriously engage the person with whom you disagree or simply to uh, dismiss that person or denigrate that person. Um, it's dying because uh, our ability to disagree well, which is to say to disagree productively, um, not necessarily always for the sake of persuading, but at least for the sake of um, sharpening our own arguments, honing them uh, against uh, the arguments of our uh, opponent, that, that seems to be um, fading, in, at least anecdotally in, in my experience. You know, Wolfgang Pauli, who was a great physicist, uh, once uh, reproved a, a bad student by saying, you're not even wrong. Um, <laughs> and I mean, you know, just, just to elaborate, if I ask a young child what's two plus two and the child says five, that's wrong. But if she says banana, she's not even wrong. And I, I, I will sometimes read comments on my column and I'll think, you're not even wrong. You, you don't even, you're not even addressing the argument that I'm, I'm making. Um, you're just bloviating. Um, and and that's, that's genuinely problematic because in order to um, disagree well, you first have to understand well. That's, that's fundamental. That, that you, you have to be able to know your opponent's arguments so well that you can not only rehearse them, you can make your opponent's argument even better than he might be able to make it. And at that point, you can engage in a genuine and serious disagreement. Now, the last thing I want to point out, and, and this, I think, is, is particularly important in an age where social media, again, this is my, my bugaboo for the day, um, but social media has two kinds of thinking, um, outcast thinking and uh, conformist, uh, uh, conformist thinking. Um, the, as far as I can tell, all serious social, literary, technological, political progress has been made by people who have the guts to disagree. All forms of community are, are, are begin with the words, I do, whether it's a marriage or, a, a, you know, an, it's an agreement. But democracy at its heart rests on the person who says, I don't, I don't agree. I don't go along. I have a separate point of view. You ought to hear me. And you know, I've thought when, when we think 50 years from now, what are the tests of, of whether America prospers or not, I think one of the great questions we'll face is whether we remained a country that remained not only receptive to gadfly thinking, but went out of its way to give those gadflies some, some space to at least make their case. If we become a society in which we treat gadflies as heretics, we're gonna have a future um, as grim as, as some of the states uh, in, 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 in places of the world where any form of independent thought is, is a potential uh, capital offense. And uh, it would be astounding if a country that is as free as America through means that appear to be voluntary walks its way into a, a, a situation where the risk of being that gadfly, of being that naysayer, 
carries such social and even uh, financial or professional penalties that nobody dares to say, I don't agree, not so fast. I have to point out, <laughs> I, I, I have to point out that the word bloviate, and I think Carl will relate to this, was actually not a word until 1920, when it was coined by Warren G. Harding, who some used to think was the worst president in American history. Carl? Oh. I, I, I could. But, but now that word has achieved a state of normalcy. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. Which was also not a word until yeah, he coined it. I, I can think of a lot more presidents that, that were far more useless than Warren G. Harding, who brought us out of a gigantic economic recession uh, by being steady and stable. But look, I, I want to play off something you said. I don't read my social media posts. You know, I, I post things on Twitter. You know, I got 600,000 Twitter followers. Who the hell are these people? <laughs> but I'm not going to read. You know, I, I make my curmudgingly chief of staff read it, and if there's something worth responding to, fine. But the problem with social media is it's sort of the anonymity of I'm posting something on Twitter or I'm posting something on Facebook. So I can say the crudest, nastiest, most vicious things, and somebody's going to pay attention to me. So I don't pay attention to them. Now, I don't know how the, 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 there are people that are worth listening to, but I'm not going to be the person that makes a decision as to whether or not I should listen to them. I'm going to give somebody else that job because it's depressing to see what social media has done to the brains of many of our fellow citizens. And I worry about... <laughs> I worry about letting them, you know, it, the New York Times, it worries me that the New York Times appears to be driven by, the, in that Dean Paquette, uh, you know, town hall meeting where he basically said, we got we to gotta pay attention to what our readers are telling us and, 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 you know, sort of begging the forgiveness of some unnamed 20-year-old digital assistant editor for having, you know, not had and for having had a neutral headline with regard to Donald Trump, I mean, I don't want our great institutions to, to uh, journalistic institutions to to lose the res the sense that they have a responsibility to call balls and strikes and not to be sitting there following their readers, you know, either to the hard right or the hard left. I, I look, I'm I'm at Fox, so I I get this. The evening, you know, Tucker Carlson is, you know, Sean Hannity is a pal of mine. They got, they, they, they're, they're, they're following their audience, which is why I'd rather be on Bill Hemmer or Chris Wallace. But this is, social media is an <coughs> insidious, corrosive influence on the responsibility of the media to tell, you know, to get the facts and not slant them and not be playing to their, their Twitter feed. And, uh, you know, we, we go through this period with each new technological advance in communications. We'll, I have a confidence we'll work ourselves out of it. Let me say one other thing in response to Senator Flake, with whom I've worked for seven years at the White House. We, we had a good collegial relationship, except he, he is, you may not know this, he is an agent, unpaid agent of Fidel Castro. <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> There's a, he's, he's in favor of a lot of things with regard to Cuba that I oppose. And I'm not going to Cuba <laughs> until Cuba is free. And this guy goes down there and lays around on the beaches all the time. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> but incentives. You, you talked about this isn't going to change until the incentives change. Maybe, but i got to tell you, I see among, particularly in the Senate, among the younger group of senators, Democrat and Republican, they didn't go there just to engage in a political food fight for their careers. And my sense is, given the right moment, you're starting to see a little bit of it. Portman, Republican, Democrat of New Hampshire, energy conservation bill, work it through, get it done. And my sense is that we're going to see more and more of that, of people saying, you know what, I didn't come here to spend six years or two years of my life or repeat that six years or two years of my life by getting reelected in a food fight. I want to get something constructive done for our country. And it works better when you have leadership that says, okay, fine, I'm the president. I'm going to try and work across party lines to get something done. But it also may work well in the absence of interference from the White House. So the, I see it a little bit now, but I sense it a lot in conversations. And I suspect I'd be interested in if, if, if you have those same kind of conversations. Is there a rising art of agreement? In the, in the well, rising, I, I don't know House. if it's agreement, but I think there's a rising desire to get something done and a recognition that the system is designed by the founders 
to require compromise. But to Henry do that, you've right. got to compromise and agree. Right. And, yeah. and, and that's why, you know, Portman and, and uh, I'm having a... Shaheen. Shaheen sit down and negotiate this out. This is why we've seen things like the war resolution. We've seen, we've seen other moments where the, the, the Congress has seemingly come together, Republican and Democrat. But more than the moments that they've come together is, I think, the desire to get something done, which I think is only going to grow in the years ahead. I hope that's the case. Let me dismiss the, the Cuba thing. Uh, <laughs> have you I, 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 I always felt that we did have these battles <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. back and forth. I always felt. Jeff, it, have you been to the beach in Cuba? <laughs> I've been down 20 times the last time. See, 20 to times the, to, to, do the, with Fidel. to do this, the, the spy swap, which allowed us to change uh, the, uh, the policy with regard to Cuba. I always felt if you want to get rid of the Castro brothers, Make them deal with spring break once or twice. I mean, come on. That's a, <laughs> let, let, let freedom ring here. That's a, let anybody go. That's a, they'd wave the white flag and say, that's enough right now. Uh, so I, I, I like freedom in that area. Um, uh, with, with I, I don't like funding the state apparatus by taking hard dollars and you know, anyway, we, we've had this conversation <laughs> for <laughs> many, many years. Many we've years, had this conversation. Years. <laughs> um, are there uh, people who get, a, get along and actually agree? Yes, um, we saw an example, criminal justice <laughs> reform, uh, just bef a, a year ago. Uh, that, that's something on a smaller scale um, that, you know, people sat across the aisle, Cory Booker, Mike Lee, and for very different reasons, uh, decided to move ahead. There's some of that happening right now. On, on climate change, I hope um, and I think with uh, Chris Coons on one side, Mike Braun on the other, Mitt Romney's involved, trying to get the Republican Party to acknowledge that there's something here and we've got to move forward. So I, I do see efforts at that. The difficulty is um, if to, to try to explain to your constituents, I'm working across the aisle. Um, on this, that's, that's not something you put in a campaign brochure these days. You used to. Uh, but not now. That, that's, uh, that's something that... Uh, Joe Biden has tried it's, and he's gotten some blowback. Yeah, and, and he, gets, he gets blowback for it. And that, that's what I think the incentives have to change in order for that. And I think they will, ultimately, because, you know, the, this populism is not a governing philosophy. You, you've got to actually um, go in and, and, and work at things. And the big problems we need to solve, debt and deficit, climate change, gun policy, whatever, you're going to have to have agreement across party lines with both parties agreeing to hold hands, share the political risk. And, and I think incentives are going to have to change before you see at a large scale those things happening. They will. Uh, it just may take some time. Jim, you know, we used to, I want to ask you about, we used to have a common base of knowledge in this country. We might disagree about issues, but we sort of observed most of the time Daniel Patrick Moynihan's advice that you're, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but nobody's entitled to their own facts. Now we live in different factual universes. How do we overcome that? I, I sort of have on this point a law of the conservation of ignorance. You know, that over time people are uninformed but in different ways. I was doing a piece maybe 10 years ago, I interviewed Jill Lepore back when she was just a history professor before becoming a, a writer, and she was saying that at any given moment in American history, most people didn't know anything about you know, history or whatever. It was because they were illiterate or whatever. So let me segue to, to a parallel but slightly different answer, which is this being a writer's festival. To me, the two great pieces of writing that bear on this question of how we come together and how we, we, we transform. These are two that have, are always on my mind, particularly in this time. One, of course, is what I think of as the seminal essay in modern American history, The Moral Equivalent of War by William James in 1910, looking back on the Civil War and saying, in the most catastrophic episode in American history, you had all these examples of bravery and heroism and sacrifice and, and idealism and all the rest. The question is, how could you have a moral equivalent of war? How could you do the great things that come in wartime without having the hideous things of war? And I think that, that American leaders who have found ways to do that, probably most notably Kennedy with, with the space program, the other is uh, Edward Bellamy's Looking Backward from 1880, imagining uh, a United States a century plus in the future that had solved its, um, its golden age problems, or uh, gilded age problems. The point I'll make just to close this is 
a lot of the big shifts in American awareness and possibility come from having a presidential personality that nobody anticipated. You know, ahead of that, uh, when I was working for Jimmy Carter, um, nobody would have, he would never have become president were it not for Nixon and Watergate. People felt there's something different we need. In different ways, Ronald Reagan after Carter and Barack Obama and Bill Clinton after the first Bush and Trump now all represented this, we are wanting something different. And I think that this sense that we are better than our government suggests now will lead to some different kind of personality, either this year or four years from now or wherever. Carl? Yeah, I want to play off something. Uh, I, I'm not certain I agree we've, we've, we're, different, we're, we're dealing in a different culture in which we, for the first time, have a disagreement about the facts. I think that our, we've had generally a sense of a common vision of, of, of where the country was and what it represented. But we disagree about the fundamental facts all the time. It was the war of northern aggression versus the you know, war of the southern rebellion. And you know, we had obviously a, different, uh, a difference of opinion about what the facts were with regard to the ability of black people to function in a society. Uh, you know, we, we've had disagreements about what constitutes, quote, the facts. And that's what a lot of the policy, the big policy battles of, of our 200 and some odd years of existence have been fought over is, is I think the truth is this, the facts are this, and we need to respond in this manner. And it's been when people have been able to galvanize public opinion by convincing people that this is the reality that we face and this is the answer we must, uh, it, it must take. That's what that, that's the resolution of these issues. I'm, I'm not certain we are a country where we've always agreed on the facts. We've had really deep disagreements about what the quote facts are of the situation. But we now have major media universes that portray two completely different pictures of the country. And I must say, by the way, one of your examples, I think the apologetic for discrimination and the way blacks were treated was completely wrong. It was wrong on the merits and it was wrong morally. Uh, so, you and I have disagreed before, so we'll disagree. Well, no, I, I, I agree. Uh, we haven't you. lost the argument. No, no, I, I, I agree with you on it. But the point is, there was a disagreement. I'm, I'm reading a book that nobody in this room will ever read called The Reconstruction in Texas, 1866 to 1880. I mean, <laughs> grassroots reconstruction in Texas. And the stories of what is happening in four Texas counties over the last 40 years of the, 20, of the 19th century is, is unbelievable. The amount of violence that took place on a routine basis, and why? Because we had a disagreement as to whether or not uh, fellow Americans were worthy of being treated as equals. But you know, can I just add one sure. point? Um, I mean, with all with great respect for for Moynihan, but it's a slightly stupid quote, and it's overused. <laughs> um, because what we're really disagreeing on, at least at a certain level, I'm not talking about you know at, at a common level, but at a certain level. The questions that we always face are, well, what are the significant facts? Um, I gave a speech, uh, actually just the other day, here, here in, in Palm Springs on the subject of um, how not to predict. Uh, I don't know how to predict, but I can think of some ways in which we predictions just almost always uh, go, uh, uh, go wrong. So, I mean, you know, we've had views about what are the significant facts, say, with, say, the trajectory of Japan in the 1980s, um, or of China today, for that matter? And if the significant fact to you in 1985 was that Japanese TVs were much better than American TVs, well, then you would think, well, that's going to tell you something about the future, that Japan is going to become a great power, and, uh, and the United States is, is going to be uh, uh, eclipsed if the significant fact was that Japan had lousy demographics and by the way real estate cost ten thousand dollars a square foot in downtown Tokyo and that was unsustainable that would lead you to a different set of, of conclusions so really I mean at a certain level but those were all facts yes I, I, I get it but for the most part what serious people disagree on is the subject of what is the significant what's uh, the significance what, of what fact yeah, what is the significance of one fact is one fact simply a point of data, or is it an, an interesting signal amidst, an, you know, to, to borrow the famous phrase, the, the, the important signal amidst, uh, amidst all the noise? I'd like to make just one, one quick uh, uh, additional point, which is that there is, there is a view that there is this thing called sort of highbrow, respectable media, which is sort of upholding 
the truth and standards and, and you know, accuracy and these values of objectivity versus garbage media that is subverting democracy. And, and to some extent, look, I, I come from the, you know, I worked for the Wall Street Journal for many years and now at the New York Times, I'm a great believer in, in elite media. But one of the problems that I think we have in the United States is that institutions that should hold themselves to particularly scrupulous standards when it comes to avoiding tendentiousness in their reporting and their analysis have not always, um, have not always met those standards as well as they should. And so they have provided an opening for unscrupulous people to say, you see, it's all fake, it's all fraudulent. The way in which demagoguery succeeds in any country is not by telling lies, it's by telling half-truths. Half-truths are far more effective than, than lies because people seize on that part of the story that appears to have some validity. And it is valid that core institutions in the United States, and I don't just mean the media, I mean academia in particular as well, have fallen down on the job of being genuine sort of disseminators of a kind of a critical epistemology that you need to have a rational, civilized democracy. And that's a serious, that's speaking to the people in, that, in, in this, this kind of audience, that's on us. That's a serious issue that we have to confront before we simply say, oh, you know, Sean Hannity's so awful and, and all these characters are such jerks, which they are, but uh, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> uh, let me. Let me, let me get to the question of whether or not we can make this better, and maybe I'll start with Jim and come down here, and then we'll, we'll conclude. Uh, I run an institute at the University of Southern California called the Center for the Political Future, uh, where we try to model an advance of politics where people are opponents, but they're not enemies, where if you lose the game, you don't burn down the stadium, uh, where we respect each other, and pardon me, we respect the truth. Uh, is there any way we can get back to that kind of politics? My observation, based on being in, in um, hundreds of smaller towns across the United States, is that is essentially how local-level American democracy is happening most places. And if that claim seems implausible to you, I invite you to go to some place you haven't been before, some smaller place, and when you get there, do not ask people about Donald Trump, or Nancy Pelosi or Hillary Clinton or anybody else, but ask them what's happening here. And our experience was we found that Greenville, South Carolina, very conservative city, and Burlington, Vermont, very progressive city, which are mapped on the opposite extremes in most national uh, discussions, actually worked the same way. If you didn't know they were opposites, you would think they're the same city in the way the university and the city government work together. So I would say um, that, that there is this still healthy fabric that it's, so it's a matter of finding whether, if that can percolate up to the national level, great. If it can't, then it's all the more important that it be maintained. So I think that, that, that going out and seeing how people are engaging and engaging oneself. Jeff, your yeah. take? Yeah, I think to Jim's point, you, when you look out there, and, and more, most recent example to me, and it, you touched on a bit of it, uh, the president uh, signed an executive order allowing or requiring that local officials sign off before refugees are received, either states or localities. And, uh, and virtually nobody, there are very few cases of localities or states that have taken the president up on that. In fact, most have affirmatively said, no, we want, and in Utah's case said, we want to receive more refugees. Please send them here. And, and so I do see that, and, uh, and, and that's certainly the example of, of what can happen at the national level it's difficult and social media certainly makes it difficult. Just one example, um, a year ago uh, after the president, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, after the midterms, uh, a Democrat was elected and she had a campaign event that was filmed where she used very crude, vulgar language in saying the president should be impeached. Since I've been quite critical of the president's use of vulgar language, um, I just tweeted out, uh, language like this should have no place in politics. The fact that the president speaks this way should not excuse the rest of us. We should be better. Within two days, there were 30,000 comments on that post. Not likes or dislikes, that was what the kids called ratioed, where there were more <laughs> comments than likes. And then they were all over the map, of course, but the overwhelming majority of them was to the effect of, 
if the president speaks this way, then so must we. Mm. It was, uh, uh, you know, if, if that side's doing it, so must we. And uh, that just points up the, the need for leadership and for people to model behavior. And yep. I think that they do that daily at the local level, mm -hmm. at small towns where you have to get along, where most elections aren't even on a partisan basis, uh, but, but you just do it because that's what you do. Uh, but if you ask them about national politics, like you say, you, you go off. So I, I hope that at the national level, we can have people who model better behavior, and that's what's important. Yeah. Maybe you should have taken Carl's advice and not read the comments. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, you'd, you'd be better. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Good, Good point. I, I, when I read the Fallows book, it, I was struck by the point that Jim has made of how different things are at the local level than in, in Washington. Mm -hmm. The more that we make these decisions at the local level, the more we seem to find practical ways to resolve it. You may not know this, but I mean, look, politics is always gonna be politics. So there's gonna be disagreements and there's gonna be good moments and bad moments, but you may not know this. The Texas legislature is not organized on a partisan basis. When, when uh, Jim was a young journalist with the Texas Monthly, I was a young staffer for one of the 16 Republicans out of 150 in the Texas House of Representatives, and my boss had been a committee chairman. To, so even today, with Republican majorities in the House and Senate, the, uh, the longest serving committee chairman in the Senate is a Democrat, mm -hmm. Chairman of Criminal Justice, John Whitmire, Chairman of major committees in the House, like transportation, are Democrats. So we only meet for 140 days every two years, and we're trying to get to two days every 140 years, but we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the fact that it's not organized on a partisan basis means that we, except for redistricting and a few high profile issues, things tend to get solved in a practical manner. So for example, remember when we all had the f financial crisis in 2008 you know, and nine, well, our legislature had to cut the absolute level of state government spending by 10%, not cut the future growth, but literally cut from where we were by 10%. And the bill passed, the budget bill passed the House of Representatives 143, uh, excuse me, 147 to three. And it was because people were forced in, in the practical ways that we are in our communities and our local towns, our counties and so forth, to find a way to get it done in a way that keeps forward progress and minimizes the politics. So uh, uh, it's probably not transferable to other states, but it, it, it is one of the great things that we have in Texas, well worth protecting, that we, 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 are, we, we Friday night football and politics are two blood sports, but when we come together for 140 days every other year, to a great degree, politics is set aside and both parties are forced to work together. Right, you have a quick take on this? Look, um, you know, the, what is the central problem with our politics today? It's that uh, too often uh, the center bends towards the fringe, whereas in a healthy democracy, the fringe ought to bend to the center. And um, I think the center is bending toward the fringe um, needlessly, which is that the gravity of American politics still is at the center. Uh, most people in America are not on Twitter or reading comments. Um, <laughs> And they are not, they haven't been uh, driven crazy and thinking about politics isn't what they do 24-7. Um, After all, even if you take the total viewer, cable viewership uh, in the United States today, whether it's MSNBC or, or, or um, uh, Fox News, it's just a small fraction of the country. What I do think has to happen is we have to recover not just the institutions, but the self-confidence of the center to express itself maybe a little more forcefully about what kind of country we want to be and what kind of country we most emphatically uh, don't want to be. And I suspect that that is going eventually uh, to happen as, as, things, as things tend to in the United States. The biggest, the worst bet in the world for the last 240 odd years has been the bet against the United States. And every few years, someone bets against the United States because China is ascendant, or the Soviets are ascendant, or the fascists are ascendant. And somehow they're always wrong. And they're wrong because what is unique about this country, the strengths of this country, aren't, aren't the, 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 the visible evidence of disarray and, and imperfection. It's the invisible side. It's what Jim saw on his flights across the country that is ultimately going to rescue and redeem us. Uh, I want to first <laughs> thank all of you. Thank Jim, uh, Jeff, Carl, and Brett.
and I want to make clear for the record that actually I think uh, Warren Harding used to be the second worst president in America. <laughs> James Buchanan, who almost lost the Civil War at the beginning, used to be the worst president in American history. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you.